Thank you so much, Pradeep. Thank you, Padmini, for sharing your journey with us. I now call upon Jaina Kothari to give us her session on the legal framework of the sexual harassment of women at, at the workplace. Jaina, request you to please come on. A warm round of applause for Ms. Jaina, please. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, BPAC, for inviting me. It's a real honor to be here and <coughs> to share the uh, platform with all of you. And I think it's uh, about time that we really focus on prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace. Uh, as uh, Mr. Bhargava rightly said, you know, uh, everyone talks about sexual harassment, sexual harassment. What are we doing about sexual harassment? It's about prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace. And I think it's great that we have um, this conclave here focusing on this uh, because we really need to understand this together. And I think it's a great platform to raise questions, to raise doubts, so that we ensure that uh, implementation of the law is taken in the right way. So I'm going to limit my uh, um, session really on what the law on sexual uh, harassment prevention at the workplace is. We spoke in the earlier session really looking at larger issues which are important, but uh, I'm looking at uh, the new legislation and trying to uh, really clarify many doubts around that. So what is the law relating to prevention of sexual harassment at the workplace? So we do have both civil and criminal law, and uh, it's important that this issue is not a new issue. The issue was raised in 97, uh, when for the first time the Vishakha case went to court. And at that time, it was highlighted that there was nothing in India, there was no law which addressed sexual harassment of women at the workplace. And it was addressed because it was seen that the right to work in a play, right to work uh, in an environment which is free of any harassment or humiliation is an important part of the right to life and we needed a law to address that. And so the Supreme Court, looking at the vacuum, uh, recognized that there is any kind of harassment at the workplace is uh, a violation of this right to equality of women and laid down guidelines which were known as the Vishakha guidelines and that kind of laid the foundation for the new law uh, to be passed. So we do have uh, the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redressal Act which came out in, in 2013. Um, uh, so this is a civil law which addresses what employers have to do uh, at the workplace to address sexual harassment. Of course, in addition to this, uh, there are also new amendments made to the criminal law. Um, there are sections of 354A, 509. All of these deal with sexual harassment of women, deal with stalking, deal with outraging of modesty of women. So all of this addresses not only what happens at the workplace, but also what happens outside, what happens on the street, what happens anywhere else. Sorry. Oh. Okay, so uh, I think it's important that we really try and understand what is sexual harassment. Uh, many times people uh, kind of uh, say that, okay, sexual harassment is rape or sexual assault and there are no rapes, so therefore there's no sexual harassment. But we really need to understand what it is, especially in the context of the workplace. So uh, uh, it's defined as any unwelcome conduct that makes the workplace a hostile or an offensive environment. It is, uh, of course, uh, there are serious issues like assault and rape, but it is not just that. We have to look at any unwelcome conduct that makes the workplace a hostile or an offensive environment, and that has been, uh, sorry, could you go back? Okay. And that has been uh, elaborated more by saying what is uh, any such kind of unwelcome sexually determined behavior? What is it? It could be physical contact or advances. It could be a demand or request for sexual favors. It could be sexually colored remarks. It could be any showing of pornography or any other unwelcome physical, verbal, or non-verbal conduct of a sexual nature. So I think what we really need to focus, one is, is it unwelcome? That means the person does not want it. If it is by consent, certainly it is not a form of harassment. But if it is unwelcome, and secondly, it need not just be physical. 
And I think uh, we really need to emphasize that. Very often it is seen as just kind of any physical uh, advances or touch or assault. It could be verbal, it could be non-verbal, any kind of behavior. It could be sending emails, it could be sending text messages, it could be sending WhatsApp pictures. But if it is unwelcome and if it is offensive, then it can amount to sexual harassment. Now a question is asked, how do I know that it's unwelcome? Oh, she didn't say anything. So, so therefore, uh, it's not unwelcome. Did she refuse? Did she, when I, uh, pro, you know, uh, we, uh, I also am part of uh, several uh, trainings for sexual harassment related uh, legislations and prevention at workplaces and also part of, uh, the, as the external member of the committee. And often questions are asked that, uh, how do I know that it's unwelcome? Um, um, you know, um, a person calls another colleague out for tea or on a date and uh, if the person goes along or if, if the woman um, responds to a phone call or responds to a text message, then he says, well, it was not unwelcome. Now, un so uh, I think we really need to focus and understand what is unwelcome. Unwelcome is to really know whether the person is willing or not, interested or not. And it's not always easy to decipher because at the workplace we have several uh, hierarchies and work codes that are being carried on. Honestly speaking, uh, let me ask you a question. Is it always possible for a very junior colleague to say no to a very senior person or her boss or her supervisor at the workplace if she's asked to go along with him? Can she say no? If he says, come, I will drop you. Can she says, no, 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 I don't want to go with you. I'll take an auto or I'll take a bus. In many situations, uh, these kind of refusals are not possible because of the power dynamics. Do you then say that it is welcome or that she solicited it? So I think uh, that is what we need to focus on and really uh, make sure that employees, managers, supervisors all understand uh, that anything that is unwelcome, that, is, that can be offensive or uh, uh, intimidating, and it could be physical, verbal, or non-verbal conduct of a sexual nature. It, uh, it is more complicated and difficult because it involves, often there are power situations, power abuses in place, because you have a person at a very, very high level abusing his or her, his power uh, equation over someone else who is much lower in the organization. Today, you have uh, you know, so many examples. You have the Tehelka case. You have the Pachori incident, where a very junior researcher uh, complained of sexual harassment. And this was not the first incident. It, it had happened earlier. And he is a well-known uh, international figure. But nothing was done. And then it happened again. So uh, in situations like this, it is, we need to recognize that it is very difficult for um, junior employees uh, to actually speak out. Even though you may have a sexual harassment uh, prevention mechanism in place, it is still difficult if the person that she's complaining against is actually the CEO of the company or the boss or the main person. How do you uh, uh, complain in, when there are such power equations at play? So it's not always that it's a supervisor uh, demanding sexual favors from a junior employee in order to get a promotion. This does happen, but things are always not that obvious. There are subtle ways of sexual harassment at the workplace to occur. It may involve innuendo or inappropriate gestures, even from a coworker or a colleague uh, who is at the same rung in the organization. So let me give you an example. Uh, we sat on a committee where uh, a complaint was filed by a very new employee at, at an organization. She had just joined a few about six months ago. And um, her complaint was that as soon, I mean, as soon as she joined, there was another employee, a coworker uh, at the workplace who was uh, very interested in her. And he was, he started, uh, you know, talking to her, uh, of course, which she responded. Then he asked her, sometimes in front of people in the organization, uh, hey, can I have your phone number? Now, she said that when he asks in front of everybody, how do I say no? 
because if I say, no, I'm not giving your number, it looks that I am really uh, you know, doubting him or I am um, not even willing to give a colleague my number. So she had to give the, her number. Then he started uh, friending her on Facebook and Twitter and all other social uh, networking websites. So she had to accept his invite because there were other work colleagues who were also, for example, on Facebook. So she could not not accept his friend request. Thereafter, he kept asking her to go out with him and um, she politely found ways to refuse it. Uh, next, he started uh, uh, commenting on all her Facebook um, statuses. And everything she would say on Facebook, he would start liking it. If she put up photographs, he would start commenting on that. Uh, he sent her uh, email and text messages. He, he one day put up a really elaborate um, love poem on uh, her Facebook page. He didn't mention her name, that it was her, it was about her, but um, I think she and most people knew that it was about her. So this went on and on, and it was, uh, so it was not very direct, uh, and so it re went to a stage where she would, if she would enter the office, and if he was there, she would just find ways to kind of go away to another room, so that she didn't have to face him, and face him asking her something else, that what next is he going to ask me, what next is he going to do? She was afraid to kind of even log in on, um, and check her mails because she didn't know what to expect, what next he would send her. Uh, finally, uh, uh, finally, then she then filed a complaint. Uh, when the issue was raised with him, that why were you doing all this, um, he raised a question saying that, well, she never said no, uh, and it was so. Therefore, how do I know that it is unwelcome? And then, um, so, uh, so the first issue was that, uh, uh, how do you understand what is unwelcome? So she, her view was that, well, I didn't respond to you, so shouldn't you get it that it's unwelcome? If you had asked me out and I don't respond or I politely say no, you should understand that it is unwelcome. So we go back to our issues of consent in gender relations. When does no mean no? Where do, does someone have to uh, say in writing, I don't want any email from you? You know, in a work context, there are certain, you know, you know uh, uh, equations that you have with your colleagues. You can't say certain things. So he never got the message that this was unwelcome. Secondly, he said, how is this harassment? Because I'm just liking her pictures. I'm just liking this. I, I didn't do anything else. So to address how is this harassment, uh, yeah, if you could just please. Uh, yeah, so we get on to what, uh, what is it really, again, the definition of what is any sexually determined behavior uh, that could create an offensive work environment. And uh, the definition of that was kind of elaborated again in Vishakha, where the court said that sexually determined behavior uh, needn't always be always sexually motivated. It could be behavior that is offensive or humiliati humiliating in a gender-related matter. And I think a lot of uh, you may know about uh, the KPS Gill case where a very senior police officer was, uh, was slapped on her bottom in full view and uh, the court said that of course that was a form of harassment. This was much before Vishakha, this was much before our Prevention of Sexual Harassment Act and it said that this was an affront to the dignity of the woman whether it had any sexual overtones or not. Um, and when we address uh, sexual harassment at the workplace, I think uh, the issue of what is a workplace comes into play. And today we're going through so many changes where the workplace is not just your office. Um, workplace could be anything. It's, of course, the law covers government organizations. It covers all private organizations. So private, I mean, more than where there are more than 10 people. So it could be private companies, uh, proprietorship uh, concerns, uh, NGOs, trusts, schools, any private organization. It includes hospitals, nursing homes, sports institutes, gyms. We know the kind of harassment that happens in so many different places. It could be any place visited by an employee during her course of employment, transportation, or house. Yeah. 
Um, okay. Now, the reason sexual harassment, there is a law to prevent sexual harassment at the workplace is because it is understood as a form, it is seen as a form of discrimination. Why is it discrimination? Because it amounts to discrimination against women at their workplace. It violates their fundamental rights to equality and to work with dignity. If you're saying that a very core right that we have is our right to li live, a right to live includes the right to work and to seek livelihood. But if I'm not able to carry on my livelihood f freely and with dignity because I'm facing harassment, then that is a, uh, a form of violation or discrimination of my right to equality. Uh, okay. Now, just to understand sexual harassment uh, better, uh, for ease, uh, the theory around sexual harassment has kind of divided it broadly into two kinds. One is something that is known as a hostile work environment, uh, and one is something that is called quid pro quo harassment. And these are just technical terms, but I'll just try and explain them to you. Uh, next, please. So a hostile work environment is um, anything that interferes with a person's work performance, it creates an intimidating, hostile, or an offensive work environment. So it could be harassment to you, which is creating an intimidating environment, like the case I told you before, where this man was constantly uh, pursuing her. It became an intimidating and offensive work environment. She didn't want to go back because she didn't want to see him, and she didn't want to get any contacts or messages from him. It, sorry, can you just, yeah. Uh, it could be where uh, there is pornography shown, there is vulgar language, degrading comments, sexual touching, embarrassing questions. Sometimes it's not employees who are themselves harassed, but they have to work in an environment where such harassment is pervasive. So let me give you an interesting example. We got a complaint from a male employee once, um, uh, working in a large IT company. And what he said was that he wasn't harassed, but he was part of a team, uh, his supervisor and his uh, team, and his supervisor was extremely foul-mouthed and vulgar and used extremely vulgar language towards women. He wouldn't uh, tell the women directly, so he, you know, if they had people, uh, women uh, um, uh, co-workers, it's not that his supervisor would go and uh, say abusive things to those women, but when the men were together, he was constantly talking badly. And he was talking badly about the women colleagues. And the men in his team were either supposed to tolerate it or join in to be the macho uh, kind of team members. And he spoke once about how they had gone to the US on a work, uh, uh, on a work project. And there were uh, two, three co-workers who were Americans and who obviously didn't understand Hindi. And they, he said, we were all at lunch together. And this man with us was constantly talking about those women's body parts in Hindi and kind of thinking of it as a big joke and, you know, because they couldn't understand it, obviously. So the women didn't complain of harassment because they didn't know what, how they were being spoken about at work. But the man who was part of the team, he said, I find it extremely offensive. I can't work with him. I don't share his values. And I don't want to be in a situation where he's constantly abusing my women coworkers. And I have to listen to it. So it could be an intimidating work environment that is created because of this. Um, other examples of intimidating work environments. We had a situation where uh, a woman colleague was again uh, uh, gone, had, had to go for a team uh, project with her team members and supervisors. Uh, and again, this also brings into place what is a workplace. So, you know, she complained about how uh, there were various comments um, being made to her about uh, her looks and her body. She said once they all went to a mall for dinner with her colleagues. So this was um, after work, they go, they go for dinner, and, but that is work related. So that also is a place where the workplace is extended. She said they went into a mall and her colleague or her supervisor was there. They passed a shop where there were mannequins wearing bikinis. And her colleague, her, her supervisor casually told her in front of the colleagues, oh, I think you should pick up something like this. It would look great on you. Now, what do you say? Is this... Um, is this offense, sexually offensive behavior? Is it unwelcome? Are you even asking her? Does she want a statement like that in front of her work colleagues? Certainly she found it offensive. Uh, she didn't say anything because what do you say in a situation where there are four or five other people? But constant comments about her, about her body, about her figure were being made. 
And uh, so all of that creates an intimidating uh, or an offensive work environment. Next, please. Quid pro quo harassment is uh, uh, where there is an exchange, a quid pro quo. So where a demand is made that I will give you better terms if you agree to my sexual demands. So it's either an explicit promise of for preferential treat treatment and employment in return for sexual favors, or it could be a demand for sexual favors coupled with a threat that if you don't agree, then you will not be promoted, or you will not get incentives, or you will not get the transfer that you want. And the threat of adverse things needn't always be carried out, but just the threat or this quid pro quo demands are enough. And often we find um, that these kind of uh, 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 quid pro quo harassment is also very, very common. Yeah, just the next, please. Um, so I'm, so this really I wanted to focus on how do we understand sexual harassment, that is the most important bit that even the ICC needs to understand and everybody else at the workplace. So the law, uh, you, the law mandates that every employer should have an internal complaints committee that will deal with complaints of sexual harassment, complaints to be reported in writing. Uh, the ICC ensures that there's equal representation of women, so there are 50% women uh, members. Chairperson has to be a woman and there has to be one external member. ICC has to, pass a has to conduct a detailed inquiry and pass some orders, uh, giving a finding whether there was harassment or not, and then give any recommendation to the management. Um, yeah, just two minutes. Uh, okay. And I think what is important is that um, as employers or co-workers or as members of the ICC, you need to look at the subjective understanding of what is sexual harassment. It is not what I feel as a member of the ICC that is sexual harassment. What is that woman who's complained? What is her uh, standard? So you have to, uh, the courts have also said that you have to understand what is harassment from the reasonable woman's perspective. Would a reasonable woman think that a comment like that, that you would look great in that outfit, be uh, offensive or not. It's not what another man thinks. Often, uh, excuse me, can you just stay on that please? Uh, complaints committee therefore are required to judge the complaint of harassment from the woman's perspective or from the complainant's perspective. Yeah, next. Um, and therefore, uh, also, so in addition to uh, setting up the complaints committee to deal with complaints, I think uh, what is important is that the law also provides that the duties of the employer are not just to set up the committee, but to ensure that you provide a safe working environment by all other measures, to display information about the ICC, to have workshops and trainings to create awareness of what is sexual harassment, to take all other measures to ensure that its employees are not being harassed, to provide assistance to the woman if there's a need to file a criminal complaint and in to ensure that the complaints committee is working well and that the complaints are being addressed in a timely manner. Uh, last slide. The last thing I want to emphasize is that it's not just harassment within your company or within uh, your workforce, but it is also third party harassment. So your employees, uh, women, can face harassment from a third party. Uh, which could be a third party or an outsider. or uh, And so the employer has to take charge to ensure that even harassment by a third party, what about customers, what about clients, what about other people or vendors that you meet, um, and what about the harassment faced by them. So that is also seen as a workplace-related harassment, and the, um, the, uh, the uh, obligation is on the employer to ensure that even third party harassment uh, that is, any other person with whom an employee comes in contact with during work is also uh, prevented, or at least action is taken to address that. Thank you. I'm. Uh... Yeah. Thank you, Jaina. I'm sorry. In the interest of time, we won't take questions from Jaina. But you have a question card in your. I'll make sure that somebody picks it up, and towards the end, uh, Jaina, I hope you're staying on. Okay, so the next session is our panel discussion. With much, without much ado, I'm going to get Divya, come along Divya, who's our moderator for this session, to very quickly introduce the panel members and get on with the session, all right? All the profiles are in the profile folders, so please just look it up and we'll save time. Thank you. <laughs>